Feeling the feet to the floor, sitting bones grounding you down, an extension through the spine, and a lift through the heart space. Just watching the beginning, middle, and end of each breath. Allowing for a short pause, a moment of stillness in between each breath. Just beginning to establish healthy patterns, healthy cycles of breath. And allowing each breath to anchor you into the present moment. And then if you just take your awareness from the head and you bring it down into the center of the chest, into the heart space. And just take a couple more breaths. And then just feeling the feet to the floor again, feel the sitting bones grounding you down. Feeling that lift through the center of the chest. And you can come to open your eyes. Thank you everyone for being here. Welcome to Rewild the Soul, setting a course home. Um, this is the fourth Rewild the Soul event that we've done here at 42 Acres, and I do it with my sister. And we were inspired by the rewilding movement happening in Britain and across the world, and we wanted to start to look at it from a more personal perspective, individual perspective about how we can start to peel back the layers that prevent us from connecting and being our most authentic and kind of real and natural selves. Um, and just starting to come back into contact with our inherent peace and power that lies behind some of the stuff that we put onto ourselves. Um, after the talks, we're going to have to reshift everything. So if you could just move the pillows, if, that you, if you were sitting on them, or the chairs just to the side and stand to the side, and then we'll just wheel the tables through should happen very smoothly, maybe. <laughs> um, we're going to have dinner by Petersham Nurseries, and the food's been inspired by the season and their connection with the environment, and most of it was grown in their farm. Um, it's such an honour that we've got Matt McCartney here with us today. Uh, Matt's an international speaker, writer, and change maker. He's also the founder of the leadership-based um, social enterprise, Embercoom and is a co-founder of the organizational change network called Liquid School. Um, over a period of 20 years, Matt was mentored by a group of indigenous elders. And during this training and ever since, he has attempted to bring together two worlds, an ancient worldview that emphasizes relationship, interdependence, and the reverence for life with the significant challenges and opportunities of the 21st century. Mac writes about his search for meaning and purpose in a culture that is captivated by values and beliefs that assault the Earth's life systems and collapse society in upon itself. He seeks to inspire the emergence of the leader in all of us and the leader who will take courageous action for a better world. So thank you very much for being here today. Thank you. Can I kick that on to you? You pin it on. Yeah. Yeah. On the floor. Okay. The mic on the floor as well. <coughs> well, that little uh, resume sounds very carefully modulated, like a well-defined, thought, well thought through, carefully planned, delicately executed life but it hasn't really been like that. So I can recall uh, leaving school. I was born in 1949, so sometime around uh, 67, 68. And uh, inside me, just uh, anguish, really, because uh, the world that it felt like that I was being offered was entirely predictable and was already all planned out. My elder brother becoming a doctor, my younger brother a lawyer, and I felt the weight of my family expectations. 
and I just knew that everything I loved as a child I was now being asked to let go of and walk towards this thing called a responsible adult professional life. So the first thing we did together my friends who went down to Woburn Abbey and saw Jimi Hendrix in concert and I remember walking into Woburn Abbey and the whole height of the whole hippie thing was happening and sensing at least that here was a, the end of a thread of a story that might take me somewhere I'd like to be. But even at that time it was very, very, there was this wild juxtaposition between all the excitement of that period of history. The whole feeling, because the feeling at that time was we could change the world, all kinds of amazing things were beginning to erupt and happen in music in every, every kind of way. And then when I went into the toilets, there was a guy lying in the urinals picking the scabs off his arm with a syringe. And it was that incredible sort of picture that stuck in my mind for a long time of the, of the hope and the aspiration and the possibility and this horrible kind of uh, collapse into a very dark, dark space. So I knew from my young years that nature was my, was the place where I received my inspiration. I knew that already, I knew from the age of four or five that I loved the smell of trees and the feel of earth and to be wading around in a river or to be climbing the trees, all these things were deep inside me. And in a period actually not so far from here, but where I, descending into not quite where that guy was in the urinals with his scabs and the syringe, but certainly a place a little similar, I had to leave London and begin to try and this set this pathway home. And we were just a bunch of youngish people and we just knew that the mountains spoke to us. And we knew that there was another way of living that was calling. But we didn't know how to find our way there. There was nobody to point the way. So at that time and in that way, and I guess I'm sure others still are doing exactly the same thing, but we hit on psilocybin mushrooms. And so we said, okay, so this is what we'll do. We fast for seven days, ten days, no food. And then we will take our fairly massive dose of psilocybin mushrooms and then we'll walk into the worst weather we can find in Snowdonia into blizzards and we'll go to the highest peaks and there we will yell and shout and cry to the gods and goddesses that we're here and we're ready and we want to live this life with some passion and so we did that and we nearly killed ourselves in several occasions <laughs> <coughs> and all sorts of really frightening things happened but I remember lying on the top of Carnath Llewellyn with lightning exploding all around, literally just exploding where we were, and sobbing with joy that somehow and through my own ignorance and stupidity I'd found my way to this mountaintop in this situation. And that all I wanted to do was to live with the lightning, was to be with the sky, to feel the weight of the mountain and never to betray, never to betray these things that I was coming to understand that I so fiercely and devotedly loved. We also knew that we needed mentors. And at that time, you know, there was nothing. You went into a bookshop, uh, the internet wasn't around then. We went into bookshop, there was nothing there, except when <coughs> Uh, Black Elk wrote, uh, the Lakota elder medicine man put out this book called um, The Sacred Pipe and Black Elk Speaks and there I formed the decision I had to go and find these Native American elders to tutor me in the education that I'd never had. So now if I can just, if you can imagine this, it's like we spent six days preparing for the ceremony. We've had to 
stitch and make our ceremony clothing. We've been banned from speaking for days on end. We're being fed very particular diet. We are in um, meetings with the medicine chiefs that are very highly confrontational, very challenging. And we're preparing for this first dance ceremony. And then the dance ground is created and there was about sort of 40 dancers all in a big circle. And then the drums begin to start rolling. And then these ancient voices just start surging up to the sky with these chants, which are so old and so long. And I, I can just feel the animal of me just going, was like just rippling through pins and um, goosebumps everywhere. We're naked to the waist, we have our dance skirts on. The whole thing is just beginning to vibrate and then in the center of the circle is the tree to whom we will pray for this next four days. And then suddenly there's a surge and the dancers are running for the tree and the whole thing begins. We dance to the tree, we come back again. We dance to the tree, we step in. We dance, you run to the tree, and then one, 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 back. Run to the tree, one, 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 as you step back. Run to the tree, one, 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 one. After about six, seven hours, the first faltering sense of, oh my goodness, four days? Uh, <laughs> no water? <coughs> Food is of no interest. We already knew we could go, we could go the longest two weeks without food. No water, it's a different thing. And then suddenly the sense of, I have to dig deep. The first day, second day, third day. Now I really feel like I'm beginning to die. And then suddenly I feel myself just, I'm up. And I can feel myself, I'm, the tree has become our Mother Earth. We're running to the Earth, we're just weeping with her, howling with her, loving her. And I felt then, I am making a pledge, I am making a promise. I am saying, I, I owe everything to you. I give you everything, all of me, the animal that is me, the ignorant, rather sort of uneducated me, the, the sophisticated, gentle me, everything that I am. And I, when that dance finished and the ceremony came to an end and then the whole, there's the there's the jug of water. I don't know if you can imagine this. You know, maybe some of you done, but you know, you, your mind, you're obsessed with water. And to hold the jug and pour the jug and water leaps from the jug. So that it's all falling and tumbling, you smell it. And it goes, and then as it hits the bowl, it goes, and you can see the vapor and everything. And you know that it is life. And it is everything, all those words, water is sacred, now you know it, know it sacred. And then the first sip, and then the words of the medicine chief. Right now you would give anything for this glass of water. Anything, you would give anything for this glass of water. But I tell you now that the moment you have sipped it, after you've had a glass or two in a few hours, suddenly your commitment will now become all maybe, maybe not. Because you, now there's no hunger. Now there's no real need. How can you drink from <coughs> this glass and promise, make a promise so deep that you know that you will never, ever forget? that you will always and forever dance to the tree. So, 
I completed my last dance uh, two years ago, and uh, that was four. And I won't dance again, because I think it might actually kill me next time. <laughs> and I'd rather not, not do that. But now, you know, I made a promise a long time ago to those same people. When they said to me, Mac, you, you, have, you, are like a, you have a foot in two worlds. You spent a long time feeling that you've been born out of time, in the wrong era, wrong time, wrong place. Creation made a terrible mistake. You know, you were meant to arrive a few hundred years ago. You, somehow you've arrived now. You feel that. But actually the timing is perfect. For we have forgotten what is sacred. We have forgotten that we owe everything to our Mother Earth. We have compromised ourselves to such a great... We have been given the ends of a story and we've been following that story on and on and on. But it is leading us deep into loneliness and a deep disconnection from everything that brings joy to a human. And on the way we are killing and killing and killing because there is a madness in our hearts. So, we need people in their context, we call them chiefs or leaders, who will speak for our earth and her people and all other beings. But that means that you're going to, you have to go to places that are not necessary. It, doesn't, it means that you do not spend all your time with people like you. You go into places where people are not like you. Because if you just all run bunched together in one little group, then you all love each other and think everything's great, but that's, that is good to do that some of the time, because we all need to, as it were, recharge our batteries, but we also need to go out. And that's where the story of the children's fire, the request that I take the story of the children's fire out into the business world, that briefly, that story being a small fire kindled in the circle of the council of chiefs and every chief having to make a promise to that little fire called the children's fire that no law, no decision, no action, nothing of any kind would be allowed to go out from that circle of chiefs that would harm or compromise the children seven generations to come. And they're saying to me, can you imagine what would happen? Were we to take the law of the children's fire inside our governments, inside our businesses, inside our universities, inside our schools, inside our religions, since many seem to have forgotten it? Were we to take that, rekindle that little fire, and require the chiefs to make the promise no law, no decision, no action, nothing of any kind will be permitted to go out from this circle of chiefs that will harm the children. Seven generations to come. The children being not just human children, but the young of all kind. In other words, it's a prayer to life. So now, I think to now, and I think of just the day, was it the day before yesterday or two, two, three days ago, with all the snow, and I find myself somewhere on the edge of the Black Mountains, near, uh, between Malvern and Black Mountains, with some new guy that I've been introduced to, who is researching with the San Bushman. How come? that the sand bushmen, when they're tracking an animal and there are no tracks, so they haven't found any tracks to track, how come they know where the animal is? Yep, you imagine it. See, they're just there. And then they, they know it's over there. How is that possible? We did, we did some work, it was deep snow on the top of May Hill with divining rods, 
measuring the magnetic field, in this case of me. And what happens, for instance, when you <coughs> carry a smartphone? The magnetic field just goes zoom. It shrinks to almost like this sort of distance. You put the phone away, you do exactly the same thing. <coughs> it goes out again. How come, and I guess some of you might know of John Young and his work. John Young, a um, um, rather new friend, wonderful, amazing guy, has spent years working with the San Bushmen and with uh, also the uh, other indigenous groups. And this story, when he's tracking this Eland, and he, they, the, the tracks have faded out. And his logical mind is taking him in one direction, but he can feel the pull in this direction. And he decides at that point to follow this. And the, this, there's a video of it, and he just, they keep going, and they keep going, and they keep going. And he was saying to me, just to, because he was down at Schumacher College a short while ago, he was saying, it made no sense. But we kept going. My rational mind was saying, no, it's over there. We kept going, and then we found the land. So the way the Sun Bushman explained it to the guy I met on May Hill, he said, you take a pebble, and you drop it into a pool of water, and you'll see the ripples go out. And then the, 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 the hunter took another pebble and dropped it in over here, and you saw the pebbles, and where the pebbles met, he said, that's how we know. Because we feel the ripples of the animal and our ripples and when they connect and they can even tell which kind of animal it is. Now why is it important? I just feel like it, we have sat together in circles and by fires for eons of time. We have shared stories together. We have lived so close to the earth and with the forests and the rivers and the streams. And, and it is all with us now. This re beautiful, refined sensitivity. This gorgeous kind of um, a sort of intimacy with life. And surely, why would we ever not wish to live and be in that space? in that deeply connected, intimate space. For how do we feel when we're in that space? We feel deeply peaceful. We feel like we are, that we do belong, that we are not some kind of strange curse that was put upon the earth to traumatize the whole place. And, you know, that we feel like we are part, because we are part. When, as with those Native Americans, they said, one time they said, we're very confused, man. We understand that when Gautama Buddha received enlightenment, he was sitting under the Bodhi tree. Why does everybody always talk about the Buddha and not the tree? When Muhammad sat in the cave and received, why does everybody talk about Muhammad and not the cave? When Moses went into the desert, why does everybody talk about Moses and not the desert? Or up the mountain, Jesus, the desert. They said, we think the tree, the cave, the desert, had something to do with these experiences. And only later did I find out, apparently, when Gautama Buddha left the tree. This is what a guy told me. He walked 25 paces or so away from the tree and then turned round to face the tree and for seven days he gave thanks to the tree. If you think about trees and how the tree in Lebanon, the cedar of Lebanon, is sacred to those people, it goes way back. If you think about the cherry tree in Japan, you think about the ash tree for Norse and Viking peoples. You think about the oak and all these things. We have always had this relationship, deep 
empathy and knowing with trees. Yet we never talk about those things. We always take the human and we raise them up and we do something with them. There's a whole thing that happened, I feel, between the words transcendence and immanence. Most of our religions now are transcendent. Everything is transcend. It's up there somewhere. That's where heaven is, isn't it? <coughs> but for indigenous people, it, immanence, where divinity and spirit inhabits everything all the time in the earth around us. I feel so much I can relate with that. With everything that we consider to be dirty, or have in the, in the past considered to be dirty, with all those things that are considered to be base, if you like. One of the Native Americans telling me in, the, in the, what they call the body spheres, which relate very much to the chakras, their first is with the genitals, and that is spirit. I love that. He said, because that is where the, little, that's where the little sun is. That's where the sparks go. <laughs> that is spirit, they say. How wonderful when, we, when, when one day we understand that our sexuality is at the core of our spirituality. When you think about the long story of, of the diminishment and the hatred and what we have done somehow to make all these things, so just tar tearing ourselves apart with these, with these horrible stories that have distorted us so badly. A long time ago, here in Britain, we were an indigenous people. And I just want to say this before I say it any further, and we always were a mixed blood people. Because we, since e ever, of course, people have been coming, either walking across when the, when the English Channel didn't exist, or arriving on the shores, all kinds of people from all over the world arriving to Britain. But 2,000 years ago, we were still a tribal people. And it's not that it was a perfect time, we were still the same mix of stupidity and wisdom that we are probably now. But if you were to ask most British people to name their tribes, very few would be able to answer you. And how come that? And of course it's because our history was written by people that didn't want that to be told. Because there was only one beginning to the story and that essentially is when Christianity began. But the names of our tribes, now who spoke to me the names of my tribes first? It was those Native Americans. Because they were trying to decide if I was worth the investment of their time. So they said, Matt, we understand you're educated, you, you know your history, name your tribes. I, I couldn't say anything. And they said, you don't know the names of your own tribal people? I said, I, I, didn't, I don't think I even ever quite registered we, that we had such things. And then one of them just said, Koritani. Ordovici, Trinobantes, Trinobantes, Atrobates, Dumnonii, Brigantes, just went on and on, all these different tribes, which sound a bit Latin and Roman. Well, they were, of course, because it was the Romans who recorded them, just like Apache, Cheyenne, Kiowa, Sioux, are not real Native American names, they're the names that we heard and created. And the Isle of Mona, or Anglesey, was the, was the spiritual epicenter of a spiritual tradition that existed all through Britain and what we now have as Europe. And on at least two separate occasions, the Roman legions refused to cross the channel to come across to Britain. It was considered to be so full of magic, so full of death, so terrified were they of the deep magic of these islands. I'm speaking about here now, you see, particularly, but if I was in another part of the world, then I would have done my homework and I'd speak about there, okay? But 
so many of us now, when we walk on a spiritual journey, we turn to Tibet, don't we? Or we turn to India, or we turn to perhaps South America, or we turn anywhere but except here. And those same Native Americans found that so deeply sad. And came out with these words, until the day comes that the people of your islands once again go to your rivers and mountains and forests to pray, we will always be frightened of you. For you see with dead eyes, everything is dead to you. Everything is only a resource to serve your own need and greed. I feel that there is an awakening happening now is a really amazing thing. So we have again a little like that Jimi Hendrix concert. We have to, we have the amazing possibility, and we have the horror of a, another end of the spectrum. We are in this place now. There are host, you know, groups like this coming together, sharing information, discussing, awakening, taking action, doing stuff. And at the same time, as you know, we are just rushing for the cliff edge. We're doing both things at the same time. I don't feel we should be too fixated about what the outcome will be, or trouble ourselves too much about that. Because we have now. And in this awakening time, I think there is a calling. I, I would say that whatever we call the spirit that moves in things, that this, 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 the pulse of life is calling and calling and calling to people. Saying you, you, are, you are called, you are summoned, you are requested to come and lend your gifts, to lend your energy, to, want to learn again what it means to love deeply. For it is a love story that we're embedded in at the moment, a walking home to who we truly could be, a coming home to the beauty of the earth. The other thing these guys said to me, the people that taught me said, we can't understand this story about trying to escape the wheel of incarnation. Some of our greatest dreamers trained and trained and still trained to cross the life-death door, to go beyond into death, to try to see what's behind the curtain and bring back knowledge. And many of them lost their lives in the process. And some returned, and the ones that returned say to us that the spirits are queuing up for the chance of a life on earth. I used to love that queuing up for a chance of a life on this garden planet. For where else will you go that you could witness, experience such beauty? Whether it's how it is or not, I don't really care. I just think that that's a very helpful way of looking at things. To understand that it's a privilege to be alive at times like this. And that grass and food such as we will eat in the meal soon and sunshine and snow and a warm fire when we're cold and food when we're hungry and water when we're thirsty and the, and the, and the joy of real friendship and the joy of real intimacy with another human and the joy that my little boy feels when he sees a dog and we take him out in his pram and he just gives a great shout and lunges towards it. We take him into a field with the sheep and he's just, just there. His whole little being, uh, you know, explodes with joy every time we take him outside and he sees nature. He just wants closeness with it. But we are the same. It's just that we got layered up. We need to unlayer need to find ways to feel our way back. And as we come home again to that intimacy with life, with earth, with tree, with sky, with food, with all these simple joyful things, 
I think we will become more peaceful and more generous, more loving and wiser. So um, how, am I, how, how am I doing for time? Does anyone know? 15 minutes. 15 minutes. I have just loved this growing learning about how we once were as a people. You know our roundhouses used to face east or southeast that we used to live in. Just the same as the Plains Indian teepees used to face. About, I don't know, some years ago when Francis Pryor and others did, did research into trying to understand what, how the inside of our roundhouses were laid out, they were able to work out that the way that the internal aspect of the roundhouses was, was formed was a reflection, clearly a reflection of the cosmology of the people. In other words, they put things in particular places because they had spiritual significance significance to them as to how they understood the world and everything, just like the teepees. The Inipi ceremony or the sweat lodge that now of course has gone around the world along with the whole sort of troublesome debate about the sort of uh, um, taking you know one of the of the sacred rites of the Lakota and just and exporting it around the people charging money for it and all the rest of it but in Bourneville, a number of years ago, when they finally found, did this research on these fire pits that they keep finding, this is near Birmingham, where there are stones that have clearly been heated, and they've always thought they were cooking fires. But there's no, now they have the science to work out there's no food, traces of food. So they then started to dig further, and as they went out from the fire, they found a little hut with like hazel, the thickness of my thumb, planted in, which had clearly made it some kind of little hut. And there in the centre was a pit with stones in it. So we were holding some kind of sweat lodge in Nippi at least several thousand years ago. And the sauna, his old name is Loyoli, which means holy. And my Maria, my Finnish friend, said in the old days, all the women gave birth inside the sauna because it was a sacred place. I think we are a people walking home, but it is very, very important that we raise our voices and that we take some risks and that we nourish ourselves in places like this, but we also travel out and refuse to be quiet or good and speak the stories of coming home and belonging, of speak, speaking the stories and what our hearts lead us to share. And I don't think it's easy. In a group I spoke to last night, a whole group of entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs, and they're all fighting with this slight tussle between wanting to have successful careers and do all the normal things that most people would like to do, and the other one of sort of somehow following their hearts and doing something good in the, in the time that they have. And most of them do it by compartmentalizing their lives and they have their day job when they earn money and then in their spare time they do this other thing. And I was suggesting to them, saying to them, really, for as long as we do that, we're only giving kind of like 40, I don't know, X percent of what we could give. And our great challenge is to somehow find a way to bring them together. So that our work is our work. One way or another, the wild will surge back, whether it's with our cooperation or not. I think the wild is just 
We'll, nothing can subsume the wild. The wild is. So the story really is not one of a choice in terms of one way. It will happen. It's just really about with our cooperation or not. And some people have said to me, well, I think it might not be such a bad thing if we were cleaned from the face of the earth. And I can understand that point of view. But it's not that that concerns me, it's the suffering in between. It's, it's, the, it's the, you know, the, the, the in vast story of pain that would happen in that process. Why on earth would we allow that to happen? There's a quote I love to use sometimes. I'll use it to finish now. And I think it's uh, the fool speaking to King Lear. He says, Thou shouldst not have grown old before thou hadst grown wise. It's our story, really undoubtedly clever, brilliant even, but wise or wisdom seems something that is rather more difficult and challenging. The Native Americans say, I spoke with the gift that creation gave to human beings is the gift of choice. And that is our great challenge. And that choice we make moment by moment by moment in the words that we use, the interactions we have, how we deal with the small, tiny small interactions of our life, with our partners, with our friends, with our family, as we cross the street, when we get into the underground, as we clamber into a taxi, and all the different stuff we do. We are making choices that define the person whom we are. So let that choice be a choice for beauty because that will actually give us over time the one thing that every human says that they want which is a happy fulfilling life it's so strange we say that all the time and then all our actions belie that isn't it strange, you know what I mean so I want a happy and fulfilling life so I'll go and do this job which I don't really enjoy doing you know and then I'll uh, I suppose I should and I'm in relationship with this person and I'll just prolong it because I can't face the, having the conversation that might mean that it separates. So, you know, I'll eat this food even though it's not doing me any good and I'll have another drink even though that, you know, it's just it's very evident signs of insanity, I think. <laughs> so just to say, this is not a story of sorrow, you see. There is a lot of sorrow. There is, will, is and will be a lot of suffering. But the story is a joyful story. The story is about coming home to life, coming home to whom we can be. And so, in that sense, it is wondrous. There has never been a more amazing time to be alive. I am so hopeful I can keep mine going long enough because it is a feast. It is an amazing experience to be at a time of such a time as this. And we will find out whom we are as a species, but also each of us individually. We'll find out whom we are. And that little bit at least rests with us. feel a bit odd to say any questions. <laughs> oh dear. Yes. Um, I wonder, you talked about the indigenous people that you men met. How did you meet them? Yeah. Well, this is a good, okay. <laughs> Basically, um, this little group of us, we had read the sacred pipe and stuff. We heard that there was a group of Native Americans arrived here in Britain who were going around the stone circles, standing stones in sacred places, making ceremonies. 
We were so excited about this, so we set off in pursuit. And we couldn't find them. Spent the whole summer looking for them. And we heard they'd gone. Next summer, we heard they were back again. We were back on the trail. We went searching for them. We couldn't find them. Spent the whole summer looking for them. Third summer, we heard they were back. By this time, I'm like a man possessed. I just got up there, and we just moved across the country, and we found them. And when we found them, I just said, you know, uh, that time we were a group of five, and I said, uh, I know that you have things I need to learn. And they, they said, we are holding a ceremony in Scotland. Uh, come up there, participate, and let's see where we go from there. And so I called Bruce McManaway. Uh, he was a healer alive at the time who had a centre in Scotland. And it, he was hosting this event. And I called Bruce, who had never met, and I said, Bruce, we're a group of five. We have to be at this ceremony with these people. And he said, uh, well, I'm very sorry, but it's full. I said, no, you don't understand. We have to be there. We've been searching three years. We have to be there. And he said, no, you don't understand. It's full. <laughs> so, OK, thanks. I put the phone down and we went. <laughs> and then we were knocking on the door and said, we're here. And he said, what's so difficult to understand about we're full? And I said, you don't understand. This, we, 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 are, we know we have to be here. So we, we were. <laughs> and we did the first vision quest in a small suburban garden with barbed wire on two sides of me. I remember thinking, this is not how I imagined it. <laughs> but it was, uh, one of them commented, he thought it was quite appropriate to, to me and how I saw myself just fenced in in this way. So that, we just went looking and searching and searching and searching. And, and after that, we were beating on the door saying, let us in. And by that time, our five had gone down to three. From three, it went to two. You know, and it was, it was hard and painful. But we did it. And then during it, so many times, I resigned twice because I, I found it too, too difficult. Because they, they, they were challenging me in all kinds of ways that I didn't think that they would. It'd be, it's too much to explain, but, but they... You know, I, like, I, th I, th I was thinking about the fasting and all that kind of thing, and I thought, I know I can do that. But they, they were so challenging. They said, you, you are intellectual, and in terms of knowledge, you, you have some wounds. You need to heal them. You need to study. You need to do all these things. Emotionally, you are this. You have to grow this. You have to find a way to become more fluent. We, you're going to cry a lot if you work with us. You're going to be crying most of the time and angry and upset and pissed off. Is that okay with you? <laughs> you know, of course you say yes, but then it actually happens. And you think, no, it's not. Every day going down to this lake to pray with the willows, the, the maidens as they call them. And every day they'd all sit around while I'm sat with the maiden. I have to pray aloud. And I'm fumbling my way with the birds, and they're just walking away, just saying it's ridiculous. You know? mm -hmm. We don't get it, you know. We don't feel your heart in this. Every day we go down. Every day I'm in tears. Every day they say, "We know it's in your guts, Matt. You must pray with the willows. Where's your voice? Where's your heart? Pray with the willows." And eventually, uh, it's so painful. Eventually, my my voice, the whole me is just there and speaking to these willows in a real way. Do you understand? I felt like now I'm there. And then I was crying again, but it was joy. I never wish to forget to speak to the willows. But you see, so we are bred on this thing that things have to happen so fast, don't we? There is no quick way. The psilocybin mushrooms or anything like it go woof and there it is and then shoo. Isn't it like that in a way? It's not to negate it. They open but then they close. They're always afterwards, yes, but you have to walk the journey. You have to walk the journey. 
and during the journey you walk through weather. You have to go through the down times, the good times, the bountiful times, the scarcity times. Anyway, that's how we found them. And the story has many facets to it, which I don't have time to talk about now, but ultimately their greatest gift was to say, you are a Brit. You are not Native American. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that. You're not just a Brit, you're English. <coughs> and I'm not English, my father's from Northern Ireland. I thought, you are a Brit. So there you are. Now, you may think the creation made a terrible mistake, and you know, all this, but that's what you are. We can teach you how to open the doorways to your own indigenous past. We can give you tools to help you find your way to the rivers and the mountains and the forests, your earth, your people, your hills. Fox can teach you, badger can teach you, raven can teach you. But in the end you'll have to walk alone, as it were. I was quite resistant at the time, but I'm not now. I really love it. <coughs> yeah. For us in this room, um, living in the city, uh, where to begin? Like, is it important to go out and kind of find rivers and mountains that we connect with outside of London, or look more on a doorstep first? And the first thing to remember is that we're in a valley. Here, is a big river valley. The Thames is flowing through the valley, so she isn't far away. She's really close. Um, I like to, I, I love coming to London, I enjoy London as London, but every now and then I set myself the task of just closing my eyes and seeing her as she was, way back, when forests flowed all the way down to the shores of the river, when the salmon were running in, in great shoals, if you like, when the whole place was alive and humming with life in that kind of way. But it still is. We leave, we evacuate London and wait a few years and of course she's there, isn't she? she comes come bursting through the concrete and everything and she'll be there. So I feel, I would say that connection, time with nature makes a massive difference. But you can be aware of nature anywhere. We have to look up and remember the sky. And even if we can't see it for the light, we know she's there, so we have to use our great gift of imagination. There are parks and gardens and trees everywhere. And they may be manicured and cut into certain shapes, but nothing can change them. They are trees. And the birds and the squirrels are still around. So I would say it is being mindful I mean, I love just, you know, in this room, we have these wild things. They have been messed around with a bit, as it were, like we have, but they are still present. These walls are made of clay and earth, and we have timber, like a ship's keel above us. When it rains, we taste the ocean. <coughs> you know? so I would say it's an exercise of imagination we must allow ourselves to feel these things. But also having said that, yes, time in, time in our gardens, time with earth on our hands, time away outside as well is a really good thing, very deeply healing. It's not, it is literally physically healing. I'm absolutely sure more and more research is happening demonstrating 
that away from nature we suffer. We are so steeped in it. So yes, I would say, finding time. And the thing is, it will feel, for those of us with whom that's not a familiar thing, it will feel very unfamiliar. But it's like everything feels unfamiliar when it's new. We just keep gently moving into it. Making things with our hands. Uh, yeah. Lighting a fire. Making a fire. All these beautiful, lovely things. I tell you, I'm going to do this with my little boy, but a long time ago with a little guy, I, he was three years old and I had a potato. And I said, what we're going to do today, Roman, his name was Roman, <laughs> what we're going to do today, Roman, is plant this potato. And he's looking at me a bit like, no, oh, okay. <laughs> so we dug a little hole and put the potato in, put the earth over the top. I said, what did we just do? He said, plant a potato. That's right. Where did we plant it? We planted it there. As, as I keep questioning, get a bit more irritated. He's thinking, oh, you know, potato. Are you sure we did? Yes. Are you sure? Said, and he dug it up. He said, there it is. <laughs> so we then planted it again. Every day when we walk past, we water it. We put some, I said, put some water on it. Thinking, why would we want to do that? Said, okay. And after a, two, three months of continuously reminding him about this potato, asking how many, we planted, how many potatoes? One potato, Matt. <laughs> we dug it up and found nine. He's just completely blown away. <laughs> and then, I say it's very important. Then we took them, washed them, chopped them up, and made chips. Now it all makes sense to him. <laughs> He's three, you know, actually any age. Now he can eat it. So it's physical. Do you know what I mean? It's not, it's not a concept, it's a real thing. I love doing these. these are, that's a ceremony. We're, there are ceremonies to be had all the time. Every, if we have a bird table, we can turn that into a ceremony. How John Young describes how the sand bushmen begin working with their children. They, they take time every day just sitting and they begin t to see what birds come. Over time they get to know the actual individual birds. And every time they go deeper they form another thread of connection. Because it's like they're being introduced to their family. We can do this. We can do this ourselves if we consider it to be important enough. I would say it's very important. Um, favorite books yeah I have but you c won't be able to get hold of it I think I found the last remaining copy it's called Hoggy about the small pig <laughs> I read when I was very little and it's like a parable but uh, that aside um, well since we're talking about wildness I love Wild by Jay Griffiths I love Feral by George Monbiot. I just recently read um, Neither Wolf Nor Dog. Uh, who's that by? can't remember his name. It's a, a, a rather sad and challenging book about a journey made just recently with a Lakota elder. Uh, also really love the books. On religion and spirituality, I love reading, though she's pretty dense, she's a scholar, is uh, Karen, is it Karen? Oh. I'm sorry, it'll come back to me later. But, um, might come sooner, I'll have to see. <laughs> <coughs> Name's gone for the moment. She's just written a uh, book about the history of violence, uh, religion and violence. Uh, she's one I saw in a TED talk, the first time say what some of the indigenous elders had said. She'd said that the whole notion of belief 
in the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, is a very recent uh, arrival, the concept of belief. And yet now so many of us cannot imagine a spiritual or religious pathway that doesn't include belief. But it's a very recent newcomer. And if you ask, uh, and in old uh, Lakota dialect, there is no word for belief. Because there's nothing to believe in. There is. They were not, as the one book says, not seekers after truth, but holding to truth. So those were some. Um, I'm sure there are many, many others. But um, oh, and uh, novels, um, Manda Scott's Boudicca novels. If any of you read them, if you wanted to find out about our own indigenous tribal past, she's written these amazing four fact books novels uh, called Boudicca, and and it's amazing because when I read a chapter into the first one, I knew that whoever had written this book was not just as it were, an author of novels, but was deep inside the subject matter. And, and she is and was. So uh, amazingly good read, but something far more. She, she got the, in, the, the revelation to write these books when her dog, a lurcher, chased and killed a hare, and the hare was pregnant. And she started getting all these dreams to start to write these books about Britain at the time of Boudicca's rebellion and period. So, those also. We've got time for one more quick question. Okay. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I just want to ask, when I, when I see the, uh, when I see the um, uprising in countries like Venezuela, Food rights in other countries in the southern hemisphere. Then I see in the UK, <coughs> we haven't really encountered those problems um, for whatever reason. But there's a lot of uh, dimensions in these countries. And traditionally, a lot of these countries have had that kind of tradition that they're very sort of um, rebellious type, they see something wrong, they fight. I'm sorry, could you say that last? In these countries, where a lot of these problems are happening, like Venezuela, they have a tradition where they're always fighting for something uh, to stand up for justice. In the UK, um, sometimes I see the marching is fine, but I see we're very passive in the UK. So do you see something crazy happens like any other countries? Do we I don't know, but I hope in some ways, you know, as you say, it's an endless cycle of fighting for freedoms. And in some ways, I feel we need to do something different. Uh, you use then the word stand. I, that's what I feel. I think we need to stand. I, ne I, I believe that this notion of them and us which is endlessly appearing in our dialogue and in, in all our things, is, is sort of going to tear us apart. Even in terms of the conscious people and the unconscious people, the good people and the bad people, the spiritual people and the materialistic people. It's a nonsense, really. So I feel that I've noticed a lot, particularly in my corporate work, but the more that I develop a position of curiosity and genuine interest and a desire for real engagement, I get much, 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 much better connection and, and as it were, engagement and outcome eventually. So I feel that we do have the capacity to stand, yes, and to stand courageously. 
The difficulty is that, in the, at least for most people, we, we are not motivated to do that until the, some kind of external threat becomes great enough for us to be motivated so to do. And so, you know, in many of those countries, the, the, the sort of tyranny that is so explicit and so obvious and so direct, you know, we haven't had that. It's, it's a bit like the frog in the, in the pot being slowly heated. So, you know, I hope that we will, not from a place of anger, not from a place of sort of, of these things, but from, a, a, if you like, more of a heart-opening place, we'll simply start making multiple decisions to stand and speak as we are feel called to do so. Yeah? Will that happen? <laughs> I have no idea. But I, one thing I would just add, I don't, so sometimes we are, if we feel that others won't, we feel inclined to accept that as an excuse for us not doing so. And I think that is something we really need to put aside and just say, irrespective of what my friends do, my family does, or anybody else, I make this choice. I stand. <coughs> And, of course, that creates the conditions where more and more people are likely to do so. And it's quite a challenge. Thank you. But good fun. <laughs>